Right, so in, in chapter two, finally we will understand, you know, what is this about supersonic and subsonic? Why does the flow change its behavior when it's moving faster than the speed of sound or slower than the speed of sound? What difference does it make? You know, if I am driving very fast in my car, I don't see my behavior different from driving my car very slow. So why is it a really big deal? It is a big deal. We'll see why in this chapter. All right? So, to start with, I'd like you to watch this clip. So, this clip... This clip is a supersonic jet flying, okay, next to a ship. The sailors are all cheering for the, for the ship coming by, all right? And I would like you to notice that two things. The noise of the engine. We will not hear the noise of the engine. The, 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 the airplane will cross the camera and will even go past the camera and we still will not hear anything. And then suddenly, suddenly we hear boom. The, the whole, it's as if the noise was coming behind the, the airplane, not in front of it. Huh? Unlike when you see the a fire truck coming toward you, and you actually see the fire, that you can hear the fire truck, and then you see it. No, this one, it will come all the way, uh, and then you'll hear the noise. And also the noise is not like a normal engine, it's like someone dropped something in your head. You know? <laughs> the second thing that we are really lucky here that he's flying on top of water. So I would like, when you see that movie, I'd like to watch that the, the, the signature of the airplane on the water it's actually behind the airplane. So it's as if the airplane is moving forward and it's bringing every, or pulling everything behind it. Pulling the noise, pulling the, the waves on the water, everything is coming behind the airplane. Right? Let's do it again. Right? And this is actually, if, if you have seen the, the movie Top Gun, if you remember in that movie there was this clip when he was very excited that he, he killed Chester. Chester is dead, remember? That's his boss, that, his training for pilot. And then he asked for permission to buzz the tower. Buzz the tower. Buzz the tower. And the, 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 the guy on the mm -hmm. tower said no, permission is denied. And he was quietly drinking his coffee. And then suddenly, you should, the, the, the clip is on YouTube, you should play it. And so he buzzed, basically, he, when he come near the tower, it's the same story. And the guy, of course, f out of panic or something, like the, the shock, you know, he basically flipped the, spilled the coffee on his clothes. And of course, he went to, he, the, you know the story, right? But, so why this is happening, you know? Why does uh, the sonic boom happen like this? Right? And why that, not just the noise, but also the trailing waves are also coming behind the, the airplane. So this, the first time they ever managed to flying faster than the speed of sound was basically in, in, in this guy, okay? In this airplane, the XS-1-47, and there is also a movie that you should rent and, and see it. And so this was the first time they flew supersonically. So, so the, the fastest air freezing was the Blackbird Max 3, right? Where you actually have a pilot. Of you can, if you have a rocket, you can fly faster than this, right? But with a, with a, with a pilot in, this is a Max 3. And actually, when, this, when they designed this, it required a lot of titanium, actually, to handle all the temperature. And they, this was built after the, the, the USA lost an, a pilot on top of Russia on a, in a U-2. And at that point, the Air Force decided that we will build something faster than any uh, rocket. Any rocket, it has to be fly faster than any rocket and should be flying higher than any other airplane so that no one can wait for you to come and shoot you. 
and no one can launch a rocket behind you. But the problem was they didn't have enough titanium to build this, so they had to borrow titanium from Russia. So they got the titanium from Russia, built the airplane to spy on Russia. <laughs> and and during all the history of the Blackbird, no no Blackbird was ever shot down, although they had it had been fired on. Right? So and and this is the supersonic now world record is actually for the an air freezing engine. Again, I'm making difference between rocket engine and air freezing engine. So rocket engine, you carry, you strap the, ro the air or the oxygen, actually. There is no point strapping nitrogen in your back. The oxygen and the fuel in your back, and you go faster as, you, as much as you can. But to breathe air, that really helped because we said the air to fuel mass ratio is huge. So if you don't have to worry about carrying your air and only carrying your fuel, that can take you for a very long trip, right? You can go to Russia and come back, carrying only your fuel, okay? So this, this end up flying basically at uh, Mach 10. They did it twice, Mach 7 and Mach 10. That was NASA, and it was flying this using hydrogen, right? Of course, the Air Force doesn't like hydrogen. It would like to carry hydrocarbon so that you can carry a lot of it and you can fly much longer. And so they end up, now they're doing the X-51. And we will talk about the design of those things in chapter seven and eight later. The inlet and the engine and the outlet will spend a lot of time into it. But for now, let's see what difference does it make if you're flying subsonic or supersonic? Why it's a big deal, right? So, that's what happens when you fly supersonically. There is this wave that forms in front of you. And if we manage to see the flow behind and after, if we see what air direction is moving before and after, we'll see something like this. So this bullet that's flying supersonically, before huh, the air flow, so it's the same thing. It's either the air is moving along around the, air, the bullet or the bullet is flying in the air. You get the same flow pattern. Right, with respect to the, the so someone sitting on this bullet will see exactly the same flow. Of course, if the air is not moving and the bullet is moving into the air, the air has zero velocity, right? But still, someone sitting on it will see that flow stream. So before the air is moving in straight line, and then suddenly when he crossed this line, he starts to divert. And it happened all the time, like, it's, sorry, it happened suddenly across those boundaries, right? So to understand why, let's look at this. See, this is a, a falcon and birds. And so why there is this kind of f structure in front of the, why there is an empty slot here in front of the bird? That's the magic word, right? That see, they see, they see the falcon and get out of its way. They don't want to be eaten. But the point is that they can sense with their eye that the falcon is coming. So if the flow can sense the bullet is coming, he will move away, all right? Like, like this. See, this is, uh, they are testing a uh, Mercedes Benz in the wind tunnel. And you can see that this is the streamline. They put smoke inject smoke in the wind tunnel. Those are huge wind tunnels to test the aerodynamics of those vehicles. And you can see, I mean, here, those points here, they didn't touch the, the, I mean, the airplane is here, so we are still a bit far away from it. And still every one of them start moving up. Huh? If you look also in that view, they start going around the airplane before they even come in touch with the airplane. They must have seen the aeroplane, the, the car coming, right? It's like, so if the, anything is moving subsonically, they actually start to divert before they hit the object. But if they are moving supersonically, they wait until they hit the object, and then they start to divert. So why is that? Again, it's the seeing the object. So the bird can actually see the falcon. But 
How did the air see the car? How did the air see the bullet? Right, so they cannot see, but remember we said the air is a bunch of billiard ball bouncing each other, and every time they hit each other, that force, that change of momentum between them, huh, how quickly does this force get transmitted? That's the speed of a pressure wave. Right? So if I increase the pressure on one side of the room, what does that mean? Suddenly there is an explosion, and that wall came down. And that explosion is moving into the room. What does it mean, the explosion? It's a pressure wave. High pressure is building on this side of the wall. High pressure means the molecules there are moving even faster, right? So they collide a lot, very much quicker. And so they collide with the next layer, and the next layer start to move even faster. And they collide with the next layer, and the next layer, and the next layer. So the speed by which that collision is being transmitted through the air that's how they figure out a train is coming. Let's get away. And they move for that train. It's all those pressure wave or all those collisions moving ahead of the object, huh? making the way for it. But if the train coming or the airplane coming is actually moving faster than the molecules speed by which they collide to the next layer, next layer, then they don't have any early warning. They basically just hit the wall. Right? So the, the, the example I would like to give is basically, you know, a blind person huh, that doesn't really see how he can sense in front of him. With his stick, right? He's doing this, this. Huh? And uh, uh, there's a you go to the right. But if that person, that blind person, his stick is not in front of him, it's behind him, Right? He will have to move like this and talk, ouch, and he will realize that there is something. Mm -hmm. His stick is a special wheel that's in front of him. So if he's moving faster than his special stick, if he's moving faster than the special wheel that turned toward him, he will collide head down. Right? So the, the question that you should say then, why it's not like this? I mean, why do they have to keep going all the way up till here? Well, well, they have to keep going here because, I mean, th there's nothing really here for them to stop. You know, they have to keep going all the way until they hit the object. But then the second question you should ask me is, well then, why did it move all the way up till here? And then, Excellent. Because those guys, uh, they will have to actually get out of the way. So then those are hitting those guys. And that, that the effect is accumulated. So eventually they hit something that's not really moving with the right speed, and then they start to move. <coughs> right? The point is that when you are flying supersonically, there is no way the pressure wave can travel ahead of you like this to warn everyone to get out of the way. You just have to come and hit that object. All right? So then, that's why it's a big deal flying faster than the signal or lower than the signal. So what would have helped me as an undergrad to understand this, if they have called it not the speed of sound, but they should have called it the speed of the, the pressure signal that warned everyone from that you're coming. Then I would have got it, right? If he said, if you are flying faster than the speed of a pressure wave warning everyone that you are coming, then the flow is different from flying, right? Smaller than the speed of a pressure wave warning everyone that you are coming. But I guess that, that it's a very long title. And also, I guess, the pressure, does the sound is the most famous pressure wave, acoustic pressure wave. So the acoustic wave, that's a very small pressure wave. That's what we are talking about. So the speed of sound, that's why, right? So then the, the choice of the name is not really that weird if you understand that the sound is a pressure wave. It's, and it is uh, the s exactly the same mechanism that will warn everyone that the body is coming, right? That's actually how we transmit noise or voice between me and you. I vibrate my, uh, my tongue and my throat and all those chords 
And then the air is now moving, and that pressure wave, those signals, that particular frequency, go all the way and hit a membrane in your ear, and that membrane vibrate exactly the same way that I was vibrating my cords. And that membrane, it's amazing, that membrane is connected to a, a long tube. It's actually because the space is not much. It's end up basically being a kind of a helical. That's the cochlea. And different, different part of that cochlea will vibrate at different frequency. And different part in that membrane has con it actually have some kind of hair cell. Those hair cell basically sense the vibration. And your nerve system is connected. It's as if it's a frequency spectrum analysis there. And he basically tell you, well, here number two and here number 20,400 is vibrating. And you would say, ah, he said A. And then the second comment, he said B. And you're like, A, B. He must be saying, and your brain basically transmit all this into, he's saying, whatever, homework. Then you get that, that word, right? So it's, it's a pressure wave. Exactly like the one that will basically tell a bullet or uh, tell the flow that a bullet is coming toward you. Right? So over here basically saying that's the difference between subsonic and supersonic. It's that signaling mechanism. Right? And so this is what happens if you are supersonic. You will have to come and hit the object and then start moving away. So let's, let's calculate that speed the speed of that signal, the speed of that pressure wave, the acoustic wave, how much is it? Because most of the homework problems, it's to calculate that speed, okay? Tell you calculate the speed of sound. So to start with, if let's, um, let's calculate the speed of that wave in a rigid body, a piece of metal. So if you vibrate or you push on it one side, that piece of metal, you know, uh, if it doesn't, if it's really rigid, really, really rigid, the other end will move immediately. You push this guy one millimeter, the other guy will move one millimeter, the other end, no matter how long it is, right? But if it's not metal, it's rubber, or plastic, you push one millimeter here on one side, and what will happen? It will deform, and then that deformation will... <coughs> will move and move and move and move. It's like a worm kind of trying to walk, a caterpillar trying to move. So that is what we are after. It's the speed of compression. It's how we can compress a medium, right? So if the medium is rigid, absolutely rigid, the speed of pressure wave in it would be infinity. If it's really rigid, huh, it would be infinity. And if it's totally, like, totally elastic, Huh? You push on one side and you never hear on the other side. The other side doesn't even move at all. So the gas is in between. The velocity will not be infinite and it will not be zero. Let's calculate how much is it. So in, in, in section 2-3, they calculate that velocity. So they basically introduce a pressure wave and a disturbance and they try to calculate how quickly does it move. So the job of this exercise to calculate this E. Alright? How much is that E? What's happening? Before, the velocity is zero. The density is rho, the pressure is P. And then suddenly, he moved that piston. He, he, the piston was moving at zero. Well, basically, it wasn't, wasn't really moving. And then suddenly, he moved it a little bit, delta V. The pressure will rise a little bit. The density will rise a little bit because, I mean, he's compressing everything in front of it. So a signal or a pressure wave will form in front of that piston and will start traveling, pushing every one ahead of the piston with a new velocity and with a new density and a new pressure. Okay? So the pressure will be B plus dB, the density will become rho plus d rho, and the density, the velocity will become dV. Not th this same exercise, amazingly, can work exactly the same if we pull the piston rather than push the piston. Because that's what our voice is doing when we speak. We basically make fluctuation in both direction. Alright? So we we in this course, in every single chapter, starting this chapter, 
I will solve every single chapter by writing continuity, momentum, and energy equation. We will drive the solution, we'll put it in appendix, and we'll use this appendix to solve the problems. In this chapter, there's no appendix because we'll only come with one equation, actually. Not, not a bunch of equations, one equation. And that equation will be, how much is the A? Amazingly, the A would become simply just the square root of gamma RT. And that's how we will solve all our problem ways. All of, not all of them, most of them. So let's see why, why it will end up being like this. But this is, this is the main equation that we will use to solve the problem. Of course, stick to SI. So that temperature should be in Kelvin or degree C? Kelvin, right. And the R, again, is 287, not kilojoule. That's the second most popular mistake that students make. They put the R in, in kilojoule. All right. So to write the momentum equation, we say what's the plus direction. And rather than using the absolute velocity, which is 0 and dv, we will use the relative velocity, which is A. So the wave is coming with A, but actually the air here that's not moving with respect to the control volume, which is the wave itself, will be moving with A. And the air behind it is A minus dV. Right? This is the pressure force, BA, and B plus dB area, rho and rho plus d rho. Something is missing from the forces. So there are two pressure forces. Any other forces that I should put? Excellent. Who said friction? Right. We Tim is right. We should put friction. But this is actually, at the end, I'm going to tell you we did this only for isentropic. Isentropic process. So we are neglecting those forces. And right. And, and this, this become this become a restriction. That w this, the speed of sound here, gamma, square root of gamma RT, this is only for isentropic process. So if there is something that has a lot of irresponsibility, the speed of this wave or disturbance will not be like this. Right? So this is done for really acoustic wave, which happen to be, you know, it's not a detonation. It's not like a, so if there is an explosion, they're trying to find out how much will that wave will actually move and hit the, the other building. It's not going to be the acoustic speed. It will be different. We calculate that shock, the speed of shock wave in chapter 4. But this is someone basically making disturbance with his voice. Alright, so you can imagine the continuity equation is m dot n equal m dot out because the control volume is very thin, there is no storage. Also it's steady. So here is continuity. m dot n, m dot out. m dot is rho a v. Rho a v. Density, velocity, area. Momentum equation. So this this actually boiled down to this. What happened? Why all those four terms disappeared? Well, to start with, uh, rho a cancel with rho a, and dv d rho go to zero. Why is that? Is that an approximation? Well, again we s we said it's a very small dv and it's very small dp. So we can take the limit, mathematically take the limit, as d rho and dv go to zero. So that term will go to zero with respect to the other two guys. Because those are first order and this is second order. So this is the first equation coming from continuity. For a momentum equation, here is the summation of the force, equal unsteady term go to zero plus m dot out v out minus m dot n v n. Those are the v out and v n. For the same reason, huh? the quantum equation will basically boil down to this. Those two equations together, when you add them together, you will end up with dB d rho a square. dB by d rho equal a square. We are almost done. Here is our A we're looking for. Huh? The A, just we are just waiting to get the square root of this, dB by d rho. Except that we don't know what's dB by d rho. We don't know dB by d rho yet. Well, we have an equation for that relate B and rho. That's the B equal rho RT, right? But we also assumed reversible and adiabatic. We as basically assumed isentropic. 
So for isentropic process, not only we will, we don't have to get the total derivative, we can just get the partial derivative, partial b, partial rho, at constant s. All right? So rather than saying that the db is function, so b is function of rho and s, no, we will just get partial b, partial rho. So then, that's the, remember we finished chapter one by this relation between the p and the rho, page 26. Remember you put a star on page 26. So, b and p and rho and rho are related to, to each other by power gamma. So, from that, you can basically get partial b, partial rho. You can differentiate partial b, partial rho, which basically become gamma b over rho, and then from <coughs> the b equal rho rt, you can take b or and rho, heat it out, and put gamma rt. So now, a square, which is was partial b, partial rho at constant s, this is partial b, partial rho at constant s, become gamma rt. Or simply, the speed of a small wave, the speed of acoustic wave, acoustic wave speed is the square root of gamma rt. And that's how we solve the acoustic speed. Right? The textbook actually have the example where you do it for expansion. Okay? You actually refer to it. So, wh what kind of problem we will have? He, and that's typical in every final, I usually give them, a lot of them, I give them the first problem would be calculate the acoustic speed for air at uh, zero degrees C and whatever pressure. Actually, the pressure doesn't really matter, right? You don't see the pressure in the equation. It's the only function of temperature. So all you have to do is basically say that the acoustic speed is the square root of gamma RT, and you just have to make sure that R is in Joule kilogram Kelvin and the temperature is in Kelvin and of course the gamma is 1.4 this would be either given or you can actually look at there's a table of all the property of gases at the end of the book it's appendix I think I can you guys open to appendix I please because sometime in the problem I would I wouldn't tell you air I will tell you helium or neon and calculate the acoustic speed what's the name of the appendix is it H or I Yeah, H. appendix H, right? So you can see there they have the gamma and the R, right? For all the different gases. And that's how you get the gamma and the R. Say that again. Appendix H. H1. H1. Any other question? So the acoustic wave speed, is that the speed of the pressure that's in front of the R? Right, it's the speed of the pressure wave basically moving in front of the object. Right. That's how quickly a disturbance in the flow will transmit throughout the flow. Okay? So, for liquids and gases, sorry, for liquid and solid, the, the speed of that pressure wave, you know, you hit one side and how quickly does this get here or sense it in the other direction, it's still function of function of, what do you think? Compressibility, it's function of compressibility, that's the main thing, it's how compressible the medium is, all right? How compressible the medium is, how quickly you can, whether you can squeeze the material or not. So no wonder, for, for liquid, it's basically function of the isentropic compressibility coefficient, and for solid, it's function of the bulk modulus of elasticity. So those are the two equations, for liquids and solids. We have another question here. So then if you're moving supersonic, you're moving faster than this? Excellent. And, and now we understand why it's a big deal to moving faster than signal or not. It's basically moving with your hand in front of you or moving with your hand behind you. Right? So the ear is what happens when you fly subsonically versus supersonically. We will measure this, the ratio between your velocity and that square root of gamma RT, that acoustic speed, we'll measure it by this number the Mach number. So the Mach number is simply V over A. So obviously when V equal A, your Mach number is one. And that's sonic, you're flying sonic. 
all right and so the 747 and the airbus and all those things fly at subsonic or supersonic Right, 0 0.85, 0 0.9, 0.87. And the uh, fighter jets are supposed to fly, some of them fly, hopefully, supersonic so that they can escape, right, from someone behind them. Right? So M greater than one supersonic, M smaller than one subsonic. So now let's see if you are flying faster or slower than that speed of sound. So let's imagine a small source. And I'm stressing small again because this acoustic speed, again, for a small disturbance, really. Okay? So when I mean, it's a really big, huge disturbance, it will not, the disturbance out of it, an explosion, will not send a wave at acoustic speed. It will be a shock wave coming out of it. Okay? So let's, let's make him fly. It's a small source, a beeping thing. Beep, 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 beep. Right? He's beeping every delta T. Every delta T, he will send a beep. That beep will move with speed A. Huh? It's different from his own speed. He could be moving with V, 5 meter per second. But his A, the, the noise coming out of him, will move with A. How much is square root of gamma RT at room temperature? What do you think? Of order of... Can anyone guess? Don't calculate, just guess in your head. How many meters per second will that turn to be at room temperature? Yes, don't calculate. I want you to... 600 uh, meters per second? It's, it's 340, more or less. So Sean was close. Right? So it's it's function of temperature. Gamma, square root of gamma RT. So in delta T, the noise will basically move this much, and that object will move only this much, right? So you can see why the noise is moving faster than him, right? The noise will move A delta T, the 340 meter per second, while he's moving at 5 meter per second. So in the small, same delta T, he just moved here, the airplane moved, not the airplane, but the car moved this much, but the noise out of it moved this far. Huh? Uh, get, uh, 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 so basically noise open the way for you coming in now let's keep him beeping okay so beep 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 and we are now looking at 3 delta t so in 3 delta t you know the noise leave from the original place is actually over here now right while he's He's only managed to move V, A, V, delta T, V, delta T, V, delta T. And the noise is basically like this. And look at those noise also never really catch each other, right? It's like just a bunch of circles. <laughs> but they never catch each other. Now let's imagine, this is still subsonic. Right? And someone standing over here. He will actually get the noise gradually coming toward him. And that, that, then you see the police truck or the, the police car coming in front of you. Alright? Now let's imagine if V equal A, what will happen? If V exactly equal to A. You won't hear it till it's right yeah, and all those circles will come and touch at one point too, right? Mm -hmm. It will be like this. Everything will just come and hit at that point. He and his noise will come with him. Now, remember the movie that we have seen in the first of the class when the airplane was flying supersonically? Not only it will come with its noise, now it will even come faster than the noise. So, beep, beep, beep. So, four beeps, okay? But let's imagine that he's not only beeping every delta T, he's beeping all the time. Actually, a jet engine doesn't beep. The engine is making the noise shh all the time. Okay, we have a jet engine in, in, in HRC, and you can hear, the, it's amazing the noise that it makes. It's, so, it's all the time. So, meaning that it's, there is not just four circles that I can plot here for you. Huh? Those are not just four circles. There is actually... 
infinite amount of circle. But the point is they all, they will all basically join together at the boundary of this cone when they all meet. And what's nice is that the, the object itself will come first and then that cone will come behind it. Right? So for example, the noise that he made delta T before, it's basically like this. Okay? So a person standing here on the floor or on the ship, this is the person. You can see his ears. So he actually, in all this place over here, he will see the airplane coming in front of his head, passing him, and he still wouldn't hear anything until that cone engulf him. So inside the cone, that's the zone of action. Outside the cone, that's the zone of silence. Right? And so that's why the airplane came, and then after it, all the noise was trailing behind. And the signature that we saw on the wave, on the surface of the water, that's basically when the cone was moving on the floor. So you can imagine the airplane really is coming be and behind a cone. She's dragging a cone of noise behind it. All right? Interesting is this angle. This angle, let's call it, this, what is that symbol? Mu. And I, am, I want you to put your eye on this triangle. I just magnified this triangle here. This triangle have this angle, mu, right? It's half the cone angle. It's not the whole cone. It's half the cone angle. So you got mu over here. And in delta t, he would have been here. In 2 delta t, he would have been here. So this distance is 2v delta t, right? And this, that's how far the noise went. This is how far it traveled. This must be a, 2a delta t, right? This triangle can also be plot here, can also be plot there. They are similar. The point is mu and a and v are related to each other through that cone. Actually, sine mu is, what's the sine this angle? It's this guy over this. It's a over v. Whether it's a over v or 2a over 2v or 3a over 3v. So mu is always a over v. And we said v over a is Mach number, and therefore sine mu is 1 over m. And so what this tells us is that if you are flying even faster, so flying Mach 2 or Mach 3, what will happen to mu? Will it get bigger or smaller? Smaller, smaller right? It will, like, it will be swept like it. Huh? And if you are flying slower and slower, the Mach angle will increase. If you are flying sonically, this will be like 90 degrees. It will just bring it with it. Right? So then knowing mu, is knowing M. So a lot of problem play on that trick. He will tell you, we put this object in the wind tunnel, we measure the angle, what is the Mach number? Obviously, if I can measure the angle, I know the M. It's this equation. Right? So this equation is pretty important. So I would say in this chapter, there are two equations that we need to learn. That the cosmic speed is the square root of gamma RT. And the second equation is that mu and M are related by psi mu equal 1 over M. All right? What is mu? It's the Mach wave. We call it the Mach wave angle. All right? So, notes also that the distance that an object, supersonic object, will fly ahead of you before you hear the noise is related by also mu. So mu relates z and l, right? You see that? So if something is flying, you know, one kilometer ahead of your head, you can calculate how much time, or at least how much distance, how much distance does it have to travel before you actually can hear it. Because, again, in this triangle, look at this triangle. Let me plot this triangle for you. This triangle that has mu over here, this would be z or h, and we can call it h. Height, h and l. So obviously, 10 mu is h over l. 
all right so there is a relation between the height and the distance let me call it h and the m and this was uh this was actually in, in a problem here let's see it first so he's basically showing that show that m this is m is the square root of l over h square square root of l over h square plus one that's problem 13 in the chapter so how, how can i show that there is a relation between m l and h can anyone help please mu right we said that 10 mu obviously from this thing is h over l and 10 mu and mu and m they are related so if only we can get 10 mu in terms of m we are done so can anyone can anyone give me 10 mu in terms of m i i know that psi mu is 1 over m right psi mu is 1 over m so i only need from you the 10 mu not the sign i need the 10 so i can plug it here get h over l what's 10 mu if psi mu is 1 over m the 10 is sine over cosine correct so what you are saying 10 mu is excellent so if if we make a triangle like this <coughs> and call this mu let me make it so that we wouldn't confuse it with the m so sine psi mu is 1 over m sorry is 1 over m so then this guy must be square one. m square minus 1 is that true yeah. so that when we add this and this they will become m square so we end up having 10 mu then 10 mu is 1 over square root of m square minus 1 so which we just said it's h over l so here you go now you you are almost there you have a relation between 10 mu and sorry not 10 mu now the square root of m square minus 1 and h over l so that's a cleaner version of it so here is 10 mu h over l and so eventually you would it's with square root 1 over square root of m square minus 1 that's h over v delta t or h over l and therefore basically you flip it and you move the square over here you will prove that m is the square root of v delta t over h square plus one all right problems are much easier than this in the in the exams and the homework it's usually it, it has to do with simply things like this a jet plane is traveling at mach 1.8 altitude 10 kilometer where the temperature is this much determine the speed of the airplane given the m the t okay and he's asking for the v sometime by the way he wouldn't tell you the temperature he would just tell you the height the altitude then what how you can get the temperature table, table i i guess H. can you find the table where it tell us the temperature as function of the altitude is it table h or i the ambient air properties anyone table uh, right so table i will basically tell you 10 kilometer what is the temperature he will also tell you the pressure but we wouldn't need the pressure for this we need the pressure for other stuff right so this is table i right appendix i you can get sorry appendix i at the end of the book you can get from it the temperature at 10 kilometer in this particular problem it was even given to us here you go it's 223 pretty cold right so we have the temperature and you want the v so can anyone help so the mac number is v over a right the mac number is v over a and a is the square root of gamma rt 
So you get done. You have the M, you have the temperature. Therefore, you have the acoustic speed. So the only thing is missing is the V. The other kind of problem would basically be saying that, well, the air at, so this is not really A and B problem. This is completely two different problem. You don't know why did he put them as A and B. But anyway, the second part is air at 230 Kelvin flow in a supersonic wind tunnel over a 2D wedge. So they had this object, a 2D wedge, and from the photograph, they take a picture, they can see the Mach angle, and it's measured to be 45 degree. Right? Determine the flow velocity. So again, T and mu, this is mu. So T and mu are given, and he's asking about the V and the A, the acoustic speed. So what should I do? Help, anyone? The Mach number is given, kind of, because he gave us the mu, right? Right, so if, if you know the mu, you know the Mach number. And so it's sine minus one, so it's, the Mach number would be uh, sine, sine mu. So sine mu is what? One over square root of two, right? And that would be, so you can get uh, the Mach number out of that, and from this, once you have the Mach number, how you can get the V and the A? The A is actually square root of gamma RT that you can get directly. And from the Mach number and the acoustic speed, of course you can get the V. Piece of cake, right? So again, the only equation, really the most important equation is v, the speed of sound is square root of gamma RT. And the second piece of information, it's that mu and the Mach number. <coughs> if you are flying supersonically, there is a relation between the Mach cone, your form, angle, mu, and your speed. It's a little bit of geometry there. Right? Very good. So, so obviously that cone of, you know, those sailors were really excited about flying ne or sitting next to a flying supersonic jet. But normal people in, in near airport wouldn't be so excited, right? As a matter of fact, there is, they prevent basically supersonic flight from many places because of the noise. People don't like to as, as a matter of fact, if you fly really supersonically near buildings, huh, you can break the glass. And they, they break the glass like this, right? So there are tricks to, to kill this sonic boom. How do they do that? Well, the inlet, NASA has a lot of research about basically the nose. You know, they can actually make the nose so that the, the pressure wave coming out of it kind of kill each other, kind of basically try not to concentrate and hit one place and become really big. Right? So you can kill the pressure by destructive interference. A pressure wave, if you add another pressure wave on top of it, but out of phase, you can kill the noise. So, you know, acoustic mufflers, you know, if you come to my wind tunnel, you will see basically at the exit, there are holes on the wall. They basically kind of know what is the main dominant frequency coming from the fan. And they, they try to basically have the wall such that the wave will come and reflect out of phase so it can kill each other. All right? So here, this is actually a pattern that was filed for 2004 for how to basically make a, a lone sonic boom, supersonic business jet. Right, so it can be done. Right, now what happens if the Mach number is, what does that symbol mean? Much greater. much greater. So much greater doesn't mean 1.2, right? No. It doesn't even mean 2. It doesn't even mean 3. It means 5 and 6 and... 10. Right, so that's, we call this? Hypersonic. Hypersonic. Right, and so what's the big deal? We we already said that if you go faster than one, the cone will just be behind you and you'll be trailing. What will happen at those very high velocities is that the temperature will be very high. And the air will not remain O2 and N2 like this. They they could be ionization, they could be other reaction, right? So it it's the hypersonic flow that's another area. All right, that let's leave this for grad school. There's a lot of research, especially after the, the accident of the, the space shuttle. 
after that, you know, you go to the AIWE conference and there are tons of papers about hypersonic flow over roughness element and how does the flow react to those roughness elements, all right? So, but those are very important for the flying of those things, you know, hypersonic uh, wave rider, that's basically the, the, the Air Force version of the X-43, right? So that's basically the X-51 uh, and and also they have hypersonic vehicles that basically kind of gliding so that's you fly them and then they will glide over a very long distance and they can fly over someone who's over hypersonic velocity so because of all this hypersonic flow is also very important right so that's the hypersonic glider that we have and so i i will finish by this